that brings our discussion now to extant apes. Um, when we talk about apes, we've got to talk about a few terms. Um, we'll start with hominoidia, the hominoids. This is the superfamily that includes humans and apes, and it includes all of the apes. Um, so this will include the lesser apes, the gibbons and siamings, uh, the orangutans, as well as uh, as well as uh, chimpanzees and gorillas. Of course, then the hominids, as we've talked about, talk, uh, addresses African apes and humans, the hominins addresses the line that gives rise to modern humans. All apes live in forests and woodlands. Now we do see chimpanzees opportunistically taking advantage of more arid habitats, uh, kind of, I mean, they've basically been forced to, as woodlands dry out. Uh, or as woodlands are uh, converted to agricultural fields, it creates this forest edge habitat, creates kind of more pressure for animals to be able to adapt to uh, kind of coexist with humans or, or disturbed habitat. The light and agile gibbons are completely arboreal and have a suite of uh, adaptations that are tied to that arboreal lifestyle. They, for example, um, move through brachiation. This is hand over hand movement through the trees, can also be called under branch uh, swinging. Because of this, they have a wingspan, you know, that when they spread their arms from tip of the uh, third finger to tip of the third finger uh, of six feet, their arms are as long as Michael Phelps but yet they're three feet tall. So, you know, having arms that long really constrains you to being up in the trees. I mean, you, when they walk on the ground, they have to do so on tiptoes, kind of with their arms out for balance, like a tightrope walker. The heavier gorillas, chimps, and adult male orangutans will spend considerable time on the ground. When you're four to 500 pounds, it's really hard to uh, stay in the trees, really hard to reach the terminal branches where the fruit is. And so, so the ape behavior though, like the knuckle walking, these really long arms, are all indicative of a history of being arboreal. So um, becoming more terrestrial was secondary. They evolved from arboreal ancestors. Some of the traits that are shared by apes and humans that distinguish them from monkeys and other primates include their body size. You know, monkeys are on average dog-sized, cat-sized, depending, right? Uh, some of them way smaller than that. I mean, the t marmosets and tamarins weigh at most like a pound, um, whereas apes are comparable to human body sizes. Uh, chimpanzees are between 150 to 200 pounds. Um, gorillas, females are about 150, males are about 400. Uh, orangutans, females are about 150, males can be upwards of about 500 pounds, so uh, considerably larger body size. They also have a longer lifespan. If you were to get a monkey as a pet, which I will say, don't get a monkey as a pet, um, you're talking about 25, 35 years. If you were to get an ape as a pet, you're talking about 55, 60 years. So um, their lifespan extends uh, dramatically relative to that of monkeys. They have a longer interval between the births of their infants. Part of this is due to uh, larger brain size. Uh, chimpanzees, gorillas are smarter than, um, than the average monkey and able to <clears throat> do more deceit, cognitive planning, forethought, that kind of thing. But because of this, um, you know, you're, you've still got constraints related to the birth canals. So um, much of their brain growth has to take place after birth. Uh, and so that's why they nurse for so long, to allow their offspring time to uh, grow their brains and their bodies to a size that allows them to forage for themselves. Their infants have to learn the skills to use a diet that requires a lot of cognition, a lot of predictive ability. They have a tendency towards an upright posture. This is true when they're on the ground as well as when they're in the trees. They're not going to walk like monkeys on top of the branches. Uh, instead, they're always going to be oriented upright with hands generally on a higher branch than feet. They have a larger brain. This is uh, driven by diet and driven by um, unpredictability of diet. If your diet's not predictable and ubiquitous, available everywhere, um, then you have to have cognition that allows you to map it both temporally and spatially. You've got to know when things are in season and you have to know where things are in season. Their muzzle is less projecting. We're moving towards a flatter face and they don't have a tail. I mean, when you go to the zoo and you look at a primate and it has a tail, you're going to be like, oh, monkey. Now that you have this knowledge, if you go to the zoo um, and, and you look at a primate and that primate does not have a tail, I don't want you to say, look at the cute monkey, right? 
you, you should say, look at the cute ape. Um, there are other differences. The teeth, uh, the, the cusps of the molars among apes, are, uh, the grooves then, the low points, give you a Y shape instead of an X shape. Um, but most of you are never going to go on and look in depth at ape versus monkey teeth. So, you know, the, the most visible difference is tail versus no tail. The gibbons are the smallest of the apes, only about 3 feet high, 12 to 15 pounds. They are widespread in the forested regions of Southeast Asia, including Malaysia, Vietnam, the Philippines, Laos, etc. They have a diet that specializes in fruit, they do, though they do supplement that with insects, eggs, and small animals. Um, when I was working at the Gibbon Sanctuary in Santa Clarita, uh, we had one um, pepino. Pepino was just like awesome at killing scrub jays and you know like three mornings out of seven a week we'd come in and there'd just be a beak and, and some feet because he would have gotten a scrub jay so some animals are better at hunting than others <clears throat> they spend most of their time just below the forest canopy when they do walk on the ground they've got to do so on tiptoes and have their arms hung out to the edges kind of slung out to the edges uh, like a tightrope walker because their arms are so much longer their primary grouping is composed of permanently bonded males and females and their pre-adolescent offspring males they're one of the few monogamous primates now that doesn't imply sexual fidelity they will go and look for uh, other mating opportunities even though they stay pair bonded um, the reason they're pair bonded is because they need the input of both the males and females to be able to defend their territory against other um, other members of the same species and so the way they defend their territory is through singing they sing duets um, and the duets have specific male voices versus female voices and so um, the males will always sing the way the males do the females will always sing the way the females do so you know in the case of the sanctuary north of Santa Clarita or in Santa Clarita um, you know we had some males who were housed without females and so they just sang the male part of the duet and didn't have anyone to answer them now in the wild if neighboring um, conspecifics heard that there was a missing voice, it means that they would have the opportunity to do one of two things. If they were unmated, it means there's a breeding possibility opened up, right? There's a male who no longer uh, has a partner because his partner may have died. Um, if, or if they're pair bonded but don't have a territory, um, it means that they may now be able to go and, and kind of kick that unpaired uh, adult out of the group, out of the territory, so that uh, they're able to take it over. So they're using those songs um, to kind of advertise that, hey, I'm still here, it's morning, hey. Um, Interestingly, the, the songs are hardwired, meaning they can't produce the calls of other species of gibbons or siamings. You know, there's no variability in what they sing. However, to properly duet, to get that back and forth, they have to have exposure to and opportunities to both listen and learn um, how to sing. And so um, at that gibbon sanctuary, uh, we had a couple hand-reared infants, Kimchi and, and uh, uh, Ayla, that um they i mean they were housed together with one another even though they were separate species but we had to go in with them and sing with them so we had to uh basically teach them this process of duetting you know for um for most baby gibbons and and siamings they would have 10 11 years to hear their parents duetting during which time they learn that proper kind of back and forth and how the song goes so um, in the case of captive reared animals um, there may have to be some actual instruction to help them uh, express species typical behavior so here we've got uh, a selection of gibbons. Here we've got the northern white-cheeked gibbon. They've got different pelage color. Uh, the, all the babies are born this buff colored and then the males at puberty turn black. Uh, this is the Siamang. You see this beautiful throat sac it allows their song to carry over vast distances. These are the ones that we have at the zoo. Um, so with a zoo extra credit you're able to um, certainly go and, and see our Siamangs. Uh, this is a Moloch or a Javan gibbon. There are fewer than 500 of them left in the wild. They are critically endangered. And here we have an Agile gibbon. This is what Pepino was, uh, the one who would kill all the scrub jays out in California. 
Orangutans, we've got two species. They used to be considered subspecies level. They've got some interesting genetic differences, including a chromosome inversion. But uh, one is found on the island of Borneo, and one's found on the island of Sumatra. They're highly endangered, um, critically endangered. Biggest threat facing them is palm oil production. And so every year around Halloween, um, zoos post you know, orangutan safe lists of candy. What does that mean? It doesn't mean you can feed them to orangutans. It just means that they've committed to using either not using palm oil or using sources of palm oil that are sustainably farmed. Now, there have been some articles that stay, say that uh, sustainable palm oil is is an oxymoron that there's really no such thing that exists but <clears throat> palm oil is used as a stabilizer in a lot of candies so that your chocolate doesn't just melt into a, a pool of you know melted chocolate um, and what's happening in Indonesia is that uh, corporations are having people set fires arson uh, to burn down forest where orangutans have habitat and then um, many of the animals die uh, or are critically injured um, and then they come and, and either illegally plant um, plantations in the disturbed forest or uh, they try to buy the land really cheap from the government now that it's not really usable for orangutans because trying to reforest an area that's burnt, been burned to the ground, I mean, it's going to take hundreds of years, it's not uh, super sustainable. Um, they are markedly sexually dimorphic. Adult males uh, don't ever stop growing. Now that being said, there's an interesting uh, phenomenon. If a juvenile male hears an adult male singing what's called the long call, um, that auditory signal flips a switch in his brain that flips a switch in his hypothalamic pituitary axis that arrests him as a subadult. So he is going to be the size of a female and he's never going to get the beautiful secondary sexual characteristics that other orangutans will get. And he will stay that way until he no longer hears a long call. So it's it's pretty interesting the way that adult male orangutans are able to reduce their competition through an auditory signal. So one of the ways that they are dimorphic is through body size. The males are two to three times the size of females. But another way is through these secondary sexual characteristics. So the males get huge uh, cheek pads that are called cheek phalanges. It's called phalanging when they start to grow these. They're basically just fat-filled pads. Uh, they also get a really large, thick guttural sac that has a lot of a throat pouch, a throat sac that has a lot of fat in it. Uh, they can use it for a pillow when they're lounging, but uh, this expands when they're making their long call. And it allows that long call to be heard for up to about 20 kilometers away. They are generally solitary, but some studies now of vocalizations have shown that even though they're technically solitary, they're, the long call is over the long term coordinating the movements of a large group. So everyone who's in that territory who hears the long call of the adult male moves in the same direction for the same amount of time. So even though they're solitary, there's a lot of communication still going on. They are both arboreal and terrestrial with body size kind of mediating how much time they spend on the ground. The tightest social unit consists of females and pre-adolescent young, though uh, females will come together in adulthood. Um, males will come together with females during breeding seasons, um, and they've got this kind of longer distance communication. There are only 45,000 Bornean orangutans left and fewer than 14,000 Sumatran orangutans left. So when we talk about being critically endangered, orangutans are the most endangered of uh, of any great ape with the exception of uh, one gorilla subspecies. And so it is, uh, we very likely will face their extinction in the wild uh, during our lifespan, particularly if we don't change kind of corporate palm oil production practices. Gorillas. Um, this has three subspecies. There's actually a new subspecies that's been named relatively recently. So we've got western lowland gorillas. This is what we have at our zoo. We've got eastern lowland gorillas and mountain gorillas. Mountain gorillas are featured in um, Gorillas in the Mist, the film about Diane Fossey. So uh, you may also watch that for extra credit, uh, the Sigourney Weaver version. Um, Diane Fossey became very politically active and very outspoken against poachers and ultimately was murdered because of it. And so a very sad story about uh, kind of studying um, mountain gorillas and then um, the circumstances surrounding her murder. Uh, the fourth subspecies that is relatively new is called the Cross River Gorilla, and there are fewer than 400 of them. So um, talking about critical endangerment, um, you know, 400 
is dire straits. Uh, we're worried about the loss of genetic diversity, and this has only been named as a new subspecies really in like the past uh, two to three years. They are very large, up to 400 pounds and six feet tall, very markedly sexually dimorphic. Males are called silverbacks, precisely for the reason that this picture shows you. Not only do they have phenomenally large body size, but the pelage, the color of their fur, also changes into this silver color. They are primarily terrestrial uh, because of their body size. The really interesting thing is that they're able to sustain this body size on a diet that's vegetarian, right? On a diet that is just herbaceous growth. So they're, they basically spend all day eating. They burp a lot. They fart a lot. They also engage in coprophagy, which is poop eating, because they are what we call hind gut fermenters. That means that they have bacteria in their large intestine that ferment the plant material, the cellulose. And so in order to be able to get the nutrients from it, they have to re-ingest that partially digested plant material um, and the bacteria. So they eat their poop and it goes through their digestive tract again. Grosses a lot of people out. I mean, I'm just, I'm thankful we don't have to engage in coprophagy. Um, they've got relatively stable social groups or harems. Each is typically led by a mature silverback male. In recent years, we've noted that um, males will team up as bachelor groups when there aren't harems available, there aren't um, uh, breeding territories available. Um, but uh, we can also have upwards of two to three adult males uh, leading a group. And so oftentimes a father and son will kind of co-lead a harem. That brings us to chimpanzees. There are two kinds, common chimpanzees and bonobo or pygmy chimpanzees. Common chimpanzees are pan troglodytes, pygmy chimpanzees are pan paniscus. Um, common chimpanzees evolved with local competition from gorillas. So the areas of Africa where we find common chimpanzees at about six to eight million years ago as forests were shrinking and grasslands were spreading the, common, the groups that give rise to common chimps um, had to share those shrinking forests with gorillas. That means they had to specialize on arboreal resources because the gorillas were a lot bigger than them. And so the plant or the ground based resources like celery, bamboo, sugarcane, etc., uh, the gorillas monopolized that. There was no way that chimpanzees could compete there. So they went for fruit and nuts and, and even some hunted game. Um, and what this resulted in, because of that competition, they've got a lot of tension, a lot of feeding competition. Feeding competition, whether it's in primates or humans, drives violence. Uh, and so common chimpanzees um, have been found to engage in, in outright warfare. They kill just to kill. They don't they don't kill their competitors and then um, like eat their bodies, you know, cannibalism, which I guess would have some kind of nutritive benefit, right? They they kill their competitors. Uh, just to kind of up their chances of being successful. So uh, they will engage in reconnaissance missions where the males will patrol the boundaries of their territory. Um, they will do sweeps into neighboring territories where they try to um, eliminate males, uh, particularly those that might be traveling alone um, so that those males won't be able to fight them in future kind of uh, battles. They uh, uh, they have intense fights and aggression, both just in terms of who has alpha status in a particular group, but also in terms of which troops uh, control access to key critical territories like nut groves. Um, you know, there was a Disney nature film came out several years ago called Chimpanzee that you may also watch for extra credit. So for all of these extra credits, you need to write a 500 word summary or 500 word essay two-thirds of that summarizing the um, <clears throat> the film or the research and one-third of that including your personal reflections and you would just submit these through course messages each one can add up to five points to your uh, your exam totals so definitely worth your while um, but in that Disney nature film uh, unfortunately it was narrated by Tim Allen um, not my favorite documentary uh, narrator. But um, there's a little boy named Oscar who in a fight over the nut groves and in, in one of these bouts of warfare, uh, his mom disappears, presumably dead. And he tries to get every female in the group to adopt him because he's too young. Um, he doesn't need milk anymore, but he needs help. He hasn't gained all the skills to be able to feed himself. 
Um, and none of the other females will take him. So he ends up getting adopted by the adult male, which is um, revolutionary because adult male chimpanzees do not adopt infants. They don't partake in any infant care. So this was something that was very unexpected by primatologists, by uh, the, the um, you know, the cinematography team, everybody, everybody's like, whoa, this is something we've never seen before. Gives you a perfect kind of Disney um, story, right? Happily ever after kind of thing. So um, that one is another one available for extra credit. Um, their sexual dimorphism is similar to what we see in humans. About t Males are about 20% larger than females. Um, they show warfare and hunting. They've been studied extensively since the 1960s. Jane Goodall, of course, uh, was one of the first to study them. So um, we've got a lot of knowledge about chimpanzees. However, one thing to keep in mind is that uh, they're changing. They are still evolving behaviorally and culturally. And so um, one there, there will be a film posted uh, this week in the learning activities called Wild Chimpanzees, which looks at Gombe National Stream where Jane Goodall worked and talks about some of her old stuff and talks about some of her new stuff. But um, it'll show things like the termite uh, fishing, you know, the, the tool used to get termites out of mounds. Um, that's been documented for at least you know 30 years 40 years but um there's a new uh, also chimpanzees have been hunting red colobus monkeys that was first documented in 1995. Um, in the past five years there's been a brand new behavior that emerged and that is um uh, bush baby skewering and so what happens is females will take branches and will sharpen them into spears and then they'll go around to uh, bush baby sleeping dens and um, stab them uh, while they're sleeping and come out with bush baby on a stick and so far that's only been observed among females um, so uh, the interesting thing is is that chimpanzees are still adapting culturally there was a headline five or ten years ago that said chimps have entered the stone age you know they're using stone tools to crack nuts they are as they now have to share uh, areas with humans um, they are innovating new behaviors new tools to be able to successfully exploit things like agricultural crops um, to be able to um, gorillas have been observed disarming poaching traps um, actually even rescuing unrelated species like uh, dikers and such from traps that poachers have set so you know we can't knock their ability to adapt uh, they're certainly trying to kind of keep pace with this increased uh, contact with humans. Bonobos are often undergraduate's favorite uh, primate. Um, critically endangered, there are about 10,000 that survive in the dense forested areas of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. They evolved without competition from uh, gorillas, and so they've got some suites of behavior, a suite of behaviors that's relatively different. For one, um, they have a lot less feeding competition. This has allowed females to <clears throat> maintain dominance over the males. Um, and they, they do this through tightly bonding to one another. So they eat a lot of herbaceous growth, including like the, the wild celery and bamboo and sugarcane. Um, for common chimpanzees, females disperse from their natal group, the group they're born into, at adolescence. And they do so when they're, they've got their sexual swellings, their estrus swellings, the big bright pink swollen butt. Um, and by um, when they disperse during adolescence, they, um, they ally with an adult male. And so they seek out an adult male and basically sexually present to him and get him to mate with her so that um, they have his support in any kind of aggressive encounters and can work on establishing themselves among adult females. Um, bonobos do something totally different. They also, uh, females disperse at puberty, but and they disperse when they're sexually swollen, but or they have their sexual swellings. But when they get to a new group, they pick out a dominant female and they ally with her and they engage in a behavior called GG rubbing or genital genital rubbing where they rub their sexual swellings together to the point of orgasm. I mean, presumable orgasm. We don't have sensors that have measured the electrical stimulation, but uh, they have vocalizations that are similar to human females' vocalizations when reaching orgasm. So um, this tightly bonds the females and maintains their um, 
higher rank over males. And so they use sex strategically. They will also use sex um, to mediate any kind of aggression. So let's say sugarcane is first in season and everybody's super excited about it and a big fight breaks out uh, over who gets access to the sugarcane. Well, um, as tensions start to rise, the entire group will then engage in widespread sexual behavior, basically a big orgy, in every possible combination. Females will have sex with females, males with males, males with females, um, and they'll do this for long enough to basically uh, disperse any aggressive tendencies. And then everybody sits down and peacefully eats the sugar cane together. So um, they mitigate conflict through sexual behavior. Um, they use sex strategically to minimize aggression. So um, they are, you know, the Woodstock generation of, uh, of chimpanzees. They are the make love, not war uh, apes uh, compared to uh, their compatriots. And, and I mean, this is totally it evolved because of a difference in feeding ecology because bonobos don't have gorillas to contend with and chimpanzees do. Um, as we talk about these critically endangered primates, I mean, we've got to recognize this is a problem that is widespread among primates. The biggest um, kind of trigger of uh, primate conservation issues is deforestation. Now, uh, throughout Southeast Asia, it's palm oil production, right? Um, but this is spreading to Africa now too. Um, and so um, as we convert forested land to agricultural land, particularly corporate owned agricultural land, and they want those monkeys or apes dead. They want, they don't want them to be able to make off with their crops. So um, we see massive loss of habitat that drives massive loss of life. Uh, fragmentation can interfere with uh, genetic diversity. And so as forests like in South America become fragmented, um, you know, it's not outright killing of the primates, but um, but you end up with a population that doesn't have enough genetic diversity to sustain itself. So in a couple generations, then you end up with populations going extinct. Humans hunt primates uh, for food. Um, you know, think about bushmeat in Africa. Um, they also hunt primates um, for uh, to, to get babies for the pet trade. Um, so you see here a baby chimpanzee cuddling with a human, right? Um, the way that you get primates for the pet trade is you kill the mom and you steal the baby. Um, so uh, pet trade drives uh, threats to primates too, as does the biomedical trade. Um, you know, we're at a point where many of the animals that we do biomedical testing on are captive bred, but not all. There are still macaques that are being brought in um, to um, to serve as as, uh, as subjects in biomedical testing. And so um, we, up until about 2014, we were one of only two countries, the Gambia being the other one, that's still engaged in uh, chimpanzee biomedical testing. Um, some decisions in Congress in 2015 changed that. We're now retiring our chimps to sanctuaries. But, I mean, upwards, uh, you know, up to like five years ago, we were still biomedical testing on animals that have similar cognition to six-year-old humans. So, um, you know, pretty uh, exploitative, let's let's put it there. Um, not really fair to animals with higher cognition um, and horrible conditions that they've been kept into. So um, primates are critically endangered around much of the world and we've got to be aware of that conservation crisis.